my notes up now. <laughs> Always good to have the notes. And on that note, welcome back to the History with Hilbert podcast. Today, I'm joined by Sarah, and we're going to be talking about the kingdom of Strathclyde. Thanks so much for being with us today, Sarah. Any excuse to talk about Strathclyde? Oh, of course. And actually, one thing about Strathclyde that you'll know viewers if you've actually or i should say listeners were on the podcast if you've ever looked into this is that there's so many different names for this kingdom you know strathclyde is one i made a video about the hen which arguably is similar and many more so sarah before we get started should we maybe unpack what we're actually talking about and all of these different names that people may or may not have heard right so the kingdom of strathclyde had a very long history um like the longest history of all the North Britonic kingdoms. So when we first hear about it, it's called uh, the Kingdom of Altclut, um, or Alocloath, which um, means the Kingdom of the Rock of the Clyde, because that's where they were based. They were based in the Clyde estuary um, on Dumbarton Rock, um, and that was kind of the center of their kingdom. Um, and that's sort of from about the fifth century, um, maybe a bit earlier, but who knows. Um, but by the year 870, um, Dumbarton Rock was sieged by the Vikings um, and they were booted out. So they couldn't be called the Kingdom of Dumbarton Rock anymore. Um, so the whole kingdom got shifted a bit south and became the Kingdom of Strathclyde, which um, later on kind of uh, evolved to be referred to as the land of the Cumbrians, which is kind of where modern day Cumbria comes from. It's a legacy of the Kingdom of Strathclyde. So one thing I always sort of try and imagine is to place this within its early medieval context. So if we we think of Scotland, obviously a lot of people will think about the Picts and they're kind of more in the Highlands, but you also have sort of the Irish connection with the Kingdom of Dol Riada. But whereabouts do the or does the Kingdom of Strathclyde fit in? Because as as you say, they move around. Are we thinking kind of the area around modern day Glasgow and then moving south as time goes on? Yeah, um, yeah, pretty much exactly. So it's around... Um... It starts off um, around the Clyde estuary and kind of moves south. So it's very much um, kind of along the west coast of southern Scotland slash uh, northern England. And considering they're a, a coastal people, was there much of an emphasis on maritime travel with with uh, crossing the Irish Sea? Because for the, the Dal Riedans, that was a, a big focus. Or for the people of Strathclyde, did they kind of look elsewhere to exert their dominance and for their kind of cultural interaction? Um. In terms of sea trade, there was probably stuff going on, but it's very difficult to tell because we've got such little uh, actual evidence from the early period. Um, certainly later on, when the Vikings um, take over Dumbarton Rock, we've got evidence of Hiberno Norse um, material culture at Govan, which is sort of near where Glasgow is. Um, but that's after the um the Britons have moved uh south. So it's very difficult to work out their um maritime contacts. But um something I look at in particular is their relationship with um the other kingdoms in mainland Britain. So like you say with Dalrieda, with um the Kingdom of Alba, um and also with the Northumbrians. Um, and the stuff we can actually see um, in the records is much more um, political stuff. We don't get much of the on the ground trade interactions. What we get in the records are records of battles, records of kings dying and kings uh, um, heirs going off to places. Right. OK. And when is the kind of date when we, when we start to hear about some kind of Brythonic entity? Because, of course, for... Uh, a lot of people, when they think of the earlier history of, of Britain, they might think of the Celts and the Romans and then kind of a bit in between that they're not too sure about. And then the Anglo-Saxons, then there's kind of Viking raids. But at, what, at which point in that kind of very loose timeline are we thinking is the start of the kingdom of, of Strathclyde or, or should we say Altclut for this earlier period? Uh, probably the bit in between. Um, so it's like <laughs> very um, start from ground zero. Um, when we talk about the Britons, um, what we mean by that are the people left in the island of Britain after, essentially after Roman occupation ended. So whether or not these people are actually, were originally Romans who sort of lived there mingled with Celts, um, these people have, um, or whether, you know, they were people who just sort of lived through the Roman occupation, 
they have this identity of themselves as um, Romans in the very early period, at least. Um, and it's then the Anglo-Saxons come in and you get these sort of pockets of Britonic kingdoms surviving in places. So you've got various Britonic kingdoms surviving in Wales, which is where they've sort of left the strongest cultural legacy because Welsh is a Britonic language. Um, but then you also get pockets of kingdoms surviving in um, the north of England, um, sort of northern England slash southern Scotland. Um, and I suppose it's only really with the Anglo-Saxons coming in that we start to see them as identifiable kingdoms but it's difficult to tell whether that's because they haven't they'd only just developed or whether that's just because of the nature of our um source material right that is an interesting point because i think when when you've got this this group coming in as we tend to think of it, and of course it's a very murky period with the you know the anglo-saxon invasion slash migration slash great cultural change depending on kind of which part of the spectrum you fall on in terms of what we actually think went on there is that people then had to create this strong sense of identity perhaps in the face of that and that's why we might hear of these new identities being created in areas like strathclyde something that i um thought about fairly recently is because I was in uh, a few months ago before the whole COVID thing kicked off, I was in Edinburgh giving a talk on the languages of early medieval Scotland. And something that I thought about and I wasn't sure was how much of a linguistic barrier Hadrian's Wall might have formed and if that might have had some kind of effect that maybe split the Brythonic languages spoken to the north of the wall. So in what, you know, potentially proto Strathclyde, because this is before the Anglo-Saxons and in Pictland as well. Is there much evidence left for the language that was spoken in, in Strathclyde and, and how might we, what kind of label might we put on that language? Where does it sort of fit in? Well, our main evidence for the language is personal names, which is not great when you're trying to work out different dialects. So they were definitely Britonic speakers, um, as were, we think, the Picts. But the Picts, we have even less uh, written evidence for than anyone else. We've pretty much, from out of Pictland, we've pretty much got a list of Pictish kings. And that's about it in terms of written evidence that comes from within Pictland. So scholars have sort of looked at this, trying to work out whether Pictish was its own, was like a distinct dialect or whether it was its own sort of language within um, the Britonic language or whether it was just you know, the same um, form of Britonic that was spoken by the North Britons. Um, we really don't know, um, unfortunately. That is unfortunate because it, it's such a mystery with the Picts. It's kind of quite a popular mystery as in what kind of language were the Picts speaking and, and where does it fit in? Because, of course, we have the, the kind of big contrast in Scotland at this point is the, the Dal Riordans because they're speaking. Uh, and let me make sure to get this the right way around. They're speaking a Q Celtic language as opposed to a P Celtic language. So a Godelic, so linked to Irish, whereas the uh, Welsh and what we think the Britons were speaking was P Celtic. Have I got that the right way around? Uh, I think so. Yeah. Yes. I think. Okay. Yeah. I. Yeah. Let me think. Oh, I can't think of any examples now because it's yes, because it's Q that then goes to C in modern Irish. So I think that's the right right way around. But essentially, that's the kind of big split among the insular Celtic languages. Is you've got the Q and the P, and then they're thinking that the Kingdom of Strathclyde was speaking a P Celtic language. So on this continuum with the rest of Britain, and, and that now Welsh and Cornish and uh, Breton in the north of France as well, that those are still the, the P Celtic languages that have survived. But no kind of uh, P Celtic language has survived from the area of Strathclyde today. Um, actually, it's really quite fascinating because in um, Cumbria, we get, even though the kingdom of Strathclyde, the king, um, the land of the Cumbrians, even though it was basically squashed out as a political entity after the Normans, it was sort of dying right up until that point, but it was properly squashed out when the Normans arrived. But even right up until the 20th century, we have in Cumbria, the records of um, uh, rural shepherds um who would count sheep using a vigesimal counting system which is counting in uh, in 20s rather than 10s and this is a Britonic uh counting system so you've got this Britonic language element that's survived in the region of Cumbria 
right up until the 20th century, even though the actual kingdom died out in the 11th. That's absolutely fascinating that something as integral, because of course for, for shepherds, counting the sheep is something you do multiple times a day when you're out to make sure the flock's there. The fact that they're still using this this ancient system of counting from uh you know from a completely different language to, to english is is really really interesting and i think i've i've looked into this before and that it's they've documented these cases from cumbria and across the border in scotland and down through lancashire but also in areas of yorkshire which always amazed me because of course the the kingdom of strathclyde and, and its various entities is is in northwestern britain but yorkshire's in the east and so i wonder how many of these pockets if you know this is what survived right up until the 20th century how many pockets there will have been through the middle ages going into the early modern period of brythonic speakers whether it was completely brythonic or some kind of creolized version of the language or, or maybe just with certain words and phrases and accents how much of that survived and has now been lost because we're all speaking standard english it's i think it's a very nerdy thing to think about a very asnak thing to think about but it's something i do think about quite a lot yeah well i i know that there's this um one scholar fiona edmonds who was talking about um how Strathclyde sort of managed to expand into the area that kind of became Cumbria because this was um, a region that had been uh, that was within the kingdom of Northumbria so the Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Northumbria but then when the Vikings took over York there's kind of a theory that the kingdom of Northumbria the Anglo-Saxon kingdom that was absolutely huge kind of fractured um, the Vikings were only interested in a little pocket of it and so there's this theory that um, the Kingdom of Strathclyde were able to expand into the bits of Northumbria that were kind of left over um, by the Vikings in a very um, sort of piecemeal fashion, you know, just sort of uh, getting what they could with Anglo-Saxons and Vikings who were already living there, continuing to live on there. So you've got these very sort of odd pockets of um, culture. That's absolutely fascinating because, of course, if we're thinking in terms of the timeline, you've got the kind of Northumbria falls in, is it 867 when you've got the Battle of York and the, uh, I think two of the Anglo-Saxon Northumbrian kings were fighting each other in the succession and the, the Danes kind of come in and wallop them both. Um, and then you kind of get the weird situation where the southern kingdom, so what had been Deira around York, becomes the kind of heart of the Dane lords, the, the strongest part of the Dane law, where today in Yorkshire you have the most Old Norse derived place names and lots of dialect words in the, the Yorkshire dialect. But then the northern part of Northumbria, and you can see it where I live, there's not very many Old Norse place names, but if I drive maybe an hour south, you know, starting to get to the southern end of County Durham into Yorkshire, you can see loads and loads of Old Norse place names. But the fact that maybe to the west, which, you know, it hadn't been conquered that long, am I right, in thinking by the Northumbrians, it had been a, a slow process for the Northumbrians to push westwards against the Brythonic kingdoms, that then that might have opened up an opportunity for the men of Strathclyde to come in and to, and to take this area. Do you think that might have been off the back? Because, of course, we're talking 867, you know, the late 860s when the Kingdom of Northumbria shatters on the impact of the Great Heathen Army. And it's, am I right in thinking it's 870 when Dumbarton is sacked by the Vikings? Could it be that this is may, maybe less of a, a conquest and more of uh, refugees from uh, Strathclyde maybe moving out of the way of the Danes? Or do you think it's a, a, a conscious political choice to take more land? Probably a a bit of both it might be a situation this is just speculation but it might be uh sort of making the most of a bad situation i highly doubt that any um because because dumbarton rock was just the center of the kingdom of outlet's power um when that was taken over that was absolutely devastating for the kingdom but then only two years later we get a record of um uh, an obituary for a king dying, which is where most of our evidence comes from, um, called um, Art Girl, I'm probably saying that horribly wrong, um, who's called um, the King of the Britons of Strathclyde. And if you look at the genealogies, he's descended from, according to the Harleian genealogies, he's descended from um, the Outlet Kings. So just two years after de Barton is sacked, we get this mention of that we get the very first mention of the kingdom of Strathclyde. So I think it's them getting booted out of their stronghold thinking, what are we going to do now? 
um, and then moving southwards into the Clyde Basin um, rather than the estuary itself and uh, going on from there. Because I'm thinking if, if um, now I've not been to Dumbarton, but I've seen pictures and you've kind of got the, um, the two very large kind of round cliffs that you've got, right? And I think it's on one of those that the fortress was sat. Yeah, I'm afraid I've never been there myself, so I have not oh, got an eyewitness account. No problem. Account. We'll have to make it the next Asnag trip to Dumbarton. I think that'll be a good one. I would be very happy. Social distancing provided, but sure. I think that should be possible. One person on each of the cliffs, that should be enough space. But I'm thinking if, if that was in kind of the estuary, that would be kind of the perfect place for an attack by sea because i think we'd be talking about probably norwegian vikings coming maybe from the bases in ireland across the sea and perhaps coming down the scottish isles and then up the river mouth whereas if they're moving southwards maybe that's further away from the direct range of the viking longships and their attacks it might be a little bit more difficult to attack them there yeah the clyde estuary is if you look at it on a map it's a really good bit of um waterway to nab if you're a viking because it gives you access to um, all the way up to uh, Loch Lomond. Um, so that sort of gives you access really actually quite far um, inland into Scotland as well. So yeah, it's a good bit of seaway to nab. And that, that would be absolutely ideal for them because of course they can use uh, sails when they're out on the sea, but then they've got the, the, the rowing power to actually get through the rivers and with the very shallow keels, it's not a problem for them to go right inland and to use that and then to get away as well before anyone can really mount a, an effective defense so maybe if they're moving more inland it's a it's a it's a, a better place to defend themselves from that kind of hit and run attack yeah i mean they were sat in quite a tempting spot these kind of questions they always keep me up at night sort of thinking about you know how much did the the vikings influence the political scene and how much was it just that extra nuisance that tipped it over the edge in a way. Well, the siege on the Barton Rock was three months long, so it was a serious. Wow. It, it was a serious endeavor. So the Vikings definitely had uh, serious ambitions there. That is very serious because we don't really, for the early Middle Ages, hear much about sieges. Particularly, it's more kind of hit and run. But this makes me think it's more a kind of organized that they they set out with the goal of we're going to take Dumbarton rather than they were passing by and thought let's let's go for it they definitely wanted it am i right in thinking and i'm not sure here that it that it was part of the great heathen army that that came up after they'd subdued some of the kingdoms that they then went on an expedition into scotland to fight the picts and then sacked strathclyde i am afraid that is out of my uh, area as soon that, as that's we get quite into okay. the Vikings. <laughs> no problem, no problem. Which, I mean, it's a good thing because I did want to ask you a bit more without getting too hooked up on, on the Viking Age and on the kind of siege mentality and all of this about their interactions with the other kingdoms before that and, and whether they, they fared well with their Dalriad and Northumbrian and Pictish neighbours or whether they came into conflict more. Yeah, well, um, this is a um, thing that I looked at a lot in my... Um... Uh, dissertation. So I was looking at specifically the Kingdom of Altclut, so Strathclyde before it became Strathclyde, before 870. Um, and I sort of look at the evidence for intermarriage because intermarriage is a nice concrete way of showing that the elites of different kingdoms were interacting. It's not just speculation if, you know, if uh, X prince has married Y princess, then you know that their families were talking. Um, uh, so what I kind of look at is their relationship with Dalriada seems a bit, um, it's a bit iffy. Uh, they do come into conflict rather a lot. There's, um, in the, I think it's the sixth century, maybe the, um, yeah, I think it's the late sixth century. You've got the Dal, um, the Dalriadan ruler, um, Aether MacGavran, um, and he seems to have had some um, uh, interaction with Northern Britons, not necessarily Strathclyde, um, but his one of his sons um, is called Arthur, which is a Britonic name. And then some of his grandchildren as well have Britonic names. So when you have a Gaelic speaking nation and then suddenly a Britonic name pops up in their genealogy, that's quite... Uh, 
to me it's anyway suspicious. yeah it seems yeah. like somebody married um somebody married into the britons um so you've got some evidence there for um maybe slightly more friendly interactions there's much later poetry so less reliable that talks about um Aethan being um a big enemy of this other Britonic ruler um called um Redach Hale um and so yeah the, the relationship seems quite iffy and there isn't a whole lot of evidence for intermarriage beyond that point until you get to the ninth century okay and with the the deal with intermarriage and the naming of children because that's really interesting it is the thinking going that it would have been the mother who would choose the name of the child has there been much uh, research into that or that it's a, a joint decision um do we know much i think it's hmm, it's difficult to tell much much later on so um thinking um sort of 11th 12th century um there's this um ruler in Galway um called Fergus of Galway and he has uh three sons and the names he gives his sons one of them is a so uh, Galway was uh, we think like a, a probably a Gaelic speaking region because mm. the name Galway comes from Galgadel which is um, the Gaelic speaking foreigner so that's right. Viking you know the kind of Norse Hiberno Norse yeah, mixture mm. um um Fergus of Galway he has three sons i think he has more than three but three in particular he three important ones yeah, important ones three we care about um one has a gaelic name one has a french name and one has um an english name like a an anglo-saxon name um and so i to me when i think this i don't think that he's married a gaelic woman a french woman and an english no woman. quite a collection if he did but i think it's a very interesting statement of his desire to be almost like multicultural to me it seems like he's hedging his bets he's I, mm. yeah he's sort of appealing to all these different kinds of um kinds of cultures and so this does complicate the issue when we look early on because there's a dimension that might that wonders if they might be giving their um you know children <laughs> names to appeal to the current climate but i think for mm. early on it's even if we can't decide which side of the family um named the child if you have a, a father with a gaelic name and a son with a Britonic name um it does seem to imply uh intermarriage i think that's a fair enough assumption and i think looking at names is is really a fascinating way of trying to understand like you say even if it's not the fact that even if it's not uh, uh you know a surefire way of guessing that the mother then will be from a Brythonic stock it's still interesting because it's looking at the culture and which way the wind is blowing because one way in which i've looked at naming practices well one was in my video series on on the normans and by looking at the names that the dukes of normandy have so you have uh rolf you know it's a very norse name but then very very soon you start to get williams and richard and stuff like this and it's french names rather than norse names and as well with the the rus so the um mainly swedes that went over to russia and ukraine and founded these these uh, duchies and princedoms there when you look at them they start off having you know very norse names uh, names like uh, ivar and olaf and things like this but then you start to get the sviatoslav and the yaropolk and the uh, vladimir and things like this and it's very interesting to see at what point this change occurs and often it is when they marry slavic wives because that's when the mother gets a say and they're saying yeah i'm not introducing a kid with a stupid name i'm choosing this slavic name or this french name or whichever so it would be interesting if if that was a model that could be replicated for for what's going on in in Strathclyde but I think one thing I should ask is obviously doing a dissertation I finished my one this year as well um you have to be really really interested in a period to want to write willingly 10,000 words on a subject so why did you decide to to do yours on Strathclyde and specifically this issue of the intermarriage oh I just love the kingdom it's just great it just that it... comes across <laughs> <laughs> it lasted i think the reason i find it so interesting is because it lasted so much longer than any north Britonic kingdom had any right to last um 
so so yeah because you've got the britannic kingdoms in wales which you know survived and uh have left a very strong cultural legacy um in wales today um but the north britannic kingdoms all of them like uh, none of them except the kingdom of um outlet slash strathclyde um survived the seventh century intact and then on from the seventh century it manages to survive it manages to just about cling on right up until the 11th century so i just i love its tenacity it really is very very tenacious because i mean like you say we're, we're mentioning the north brythonic kingdoms but which other ones are we talking about because of course you we've got the ones in wales and they go on to you know remain wales and welsh and then i guess in the south you've got cornwall which is another interesting example but in the north what what else are we talking about we've got elmet in yorkshire and then i think you've got the um oh now is it hreged in in the kind of old brythonic language which was sort of the area of Cumbria and Lancashire that eventually gets conquered by the Northumbrians and the Godothin north of the, the Firth of Forth. Is that about right? Yeah, the Godothin were um, sort of based around Edinburgh um, and Reged, we really have no clue. It's quite funny looking at maps in history books because generally Reged on a map is written with very wide space text and a question mark at the end. Um, <laughs> I think like historians tend to place it on a basis of um, fill in the gaps. You know, we can sort of work yeah. out where these other kingdoms are. Where's a plausible big space where we can put Reged? So it's kind of based on negative evidence rather than evidence that there was a border here, there was a border there. Uh, this wasn't where the Northumbrians were, so that's where we're going to put Reged. Yeah, we think there was a river somewhere, but uh, that's about as specific as we could probably get. It is a shame, and again, it's it's quite bad me saying this when I'm in a podcast on the Kingdom of Strathclyde, but really the only reason I know about Reged is because I looked at the Kingdom of Northumbria's early history, and they were sort of the ones that were always getting their, their cranium staved in by Ethelfrith, and uh, you know Oswald then goes up and you know yeets them out of Edinburgh, the Godothin out of Edinburgh, and they, of course, they... Um, uh, the, the Godothin get killed at the Battle of Catrath, which might be Catterick in Yorkshire, but looking at them in their own right is really fascinating, but it does raise the question of how come the Kingdom of Strathclyde in all its iterations was able to cling on, whereas all these other ones fell. Was there something special about that kingdom? Did it, you know, was it just the location it was in? Was it m more culturally astute? Were its soldiers better? D do we have any, any idea why? Uh, my fan theory about this is the Picts so we love the fan theory <laughs> please please indulge us well um so uh, when um y you read stuff about um the sort of northern Britonic kingdoms the picks get a lot of attention because they've sort of got this they've sort of survived in um popular popular culture popular memory um lots of i mean yeah quite a few scottish people i've uh known sort of have this idea of being descended from the Picts, you know, whether or not that's um, uh, historically accurate, but, you know, they've sort of been a, been adopted in some way. Um, so scholarship on it tends to focus a lot on the Picts and thinks of the kingdom of Outclut, the kingdom of Strathclyde, uh, it's the kingdom of Outclut at this time, um, as in the Picts shadow. But what I was looking at is, um, I think the evidence for um, the interactions between Outclut and Pickland seems to tip in the favour of Outclut because if you the Pictish um, the Pictish royal line, as it were, if we can call such a thing, the Pictish kings, they seem to come from lots of different external dynasties. They always seem to be provided by an external dynasty. And throughout the seventh century, um, they are very regularly supplied by the kingdom of Outclut, particularly the dynasty of um, this one figure called um, Nathan Map Gwydno. Um, now, Nathan Map Gwydno um, lived in the late sixth century, um, and he he was a king of Outclut, but also his um, reign correlates with a name in the Pictish king lists called um, Nectu Nepos Oeb, 
um, which again, I'm probably saying horribly wrong. So if we sort of think of the two as the same pe person, which I think is very plausible, um, this Nathan ruled both Outlet and Pickland at the same time. And then you get lots of Pictish kings descended from Nathan. Well, I say lots of the, um, there's one in particular, um, Brede Mac, um, Mac Belly. He's um, one of the most famous Pictish kings. Um, he was the one who won the um, Battle of Nectanismir in 685, which was against the Northumbrians. And that's kind of responsible for breaking Northumbrian hold over Pickland and over um, sort of north of England. Um, and so he's the grandson of Nathan Map Gwydno, and his father, uh, Belly, um, was also a king of Outclut. So you've got these p very powerful Pictish kings who are kind of supplied by Outclut. And so I think my fan theory for the reason um, Outclut survived the seventh century is because they were so closely tied to Pickland. Um, and sort of, and through that became very powerful. I think it, I think they were probably the most powerful um, North Britonic kingdom throughout the seventh century because of their control of Pickland. That's absolutely fascinating, and I had no idea that they they'd supplied so many kings from the Northumbrian side. I I know that there were a few Northumbrian candidates that became became king in in Pickland as well, and that I think one of the and I can't remember which one, but one of the Northumbrians marries a, a Pictish queen as well, and then supplies the kings. But it's very interesting that they kind of get their king from an external place, and if they're getting many of their kings from Strathclyde, then in a way it means that Strathclyde and Pickland are politically intertwined, especially as if, as you say, with that individual, was it uh, Mathan, the, the name yes. of the king? That if he's ruled, ruling both at once, then you've got, you know, the political power and the manpower of both to, to back yourself up. Yeah. Is I, there much? Yes. Yeah, please. Oh, sorry, I was just going to say, oh, and also the... Um... Actually, the Northumbrian king that you mentioned, um, that's uh, Ianfrith of Bernicia. Um, yes. His, yeah, it was his son, um, Talorgan, um, or Talorcan, I don't know how to say it. Um, oh, who's... me neither. It's Pictish, <laughs> it's all correct, it's fine. We don't know how to say it, so it's fine. <laughs> who knows? Um, but yeah, so he was the one who became um, a Pictish king. But actually, Ianfrith um, married, we think he married a Pictish um, princess while, while in exile. But I kind of think that, um, so through my research, I noticed that one scholar, um, James Fraser, thinks that it was likely that Aamfrith took refuge with a southern Pictish um, ruler um, because Tolokan is active in the southern Pickland area. And actually it's southern Pickland that Nathan Map Gwydno seems to be active in. So I kind of... Uh, obviously, th this gets a little bit tinfoil hatty, but I think that um, Aamfrith was actually hosted in the um, court of Nathan Map Gwydno, who was both a Pictish king and an Outclut king. So ah. the Outclut dynasty really have their fingers in a lot of pies, thanks to Nathan. That's, so in the case of Southern Pictish Kingdom, we're reading Strathclyde, maybe? Um, not exactly. It is separate, but mm. I think for the seventh century, their dynasties are so intertwined um, that it's reasonable to almost not quite, but almost think of their dynasties as interchangeable. And it's only really after Brithe. Again, this is sort of a, my fan, my fan theory. But um, I think it's only really after um, Brede, Map, uh, Brede Map Belly that Pickland really became a force to be reckoned with in its own right. And that's it's pretty much immediately after Brede's death that the dynasty of Nathan lose their grip on um, Pickland and the uh, the dull, um, the Gaelic rulers um, uh, Brithe Macdaile and Nectan Macdaile get their hands on Pickland. 
and then the balance of power shifts from it, the kingdom of Strathclyde being the one sort of pulling the strings and supplying the kings in Pickland to the, the Dol Reardons having that prominent position. Love the rhyme, yes. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad you noticed. I was very tempted to say something, but I thought <laughs> I'll let it go. I'll let it go. But no, I'm glad you noticed. But that is interesting. And how did that politically, did that have a, a sort of aftermath for the kingdom of Strathclyde now that they'd lost that influence? In Pickland, do we start to see that they're starting to lose territory to the Northumbrians or the, the Dal Riordans at all? Or do they manage to hold their own, but in a more limited fashion? I think they still manage to hold their own. Um, it's really the 7th century that's their their time to shine. Um, I do say there's a lot of evidence for them supplying Pictish kings. All the evidence is very, very obscure and in some ways requires, you know, stacking a house of cards on a house of cards um but i do think there is definitely grounds for saying that a lot of their kings were supplied by output at first but yes after the um after the seventh century they never quite reached that peak but remember by this point they'd outlasted the other north Bretonic kingdoms so they'd managed to get through the seventh century um and so after which is that, an achievement for yeah. a north Bretonic kingdom <laughs> let's not forget so I feel like once once they got over that century, they could cling on. They could kind of, you know, breathe a, breathe a, a breath and yeah. sit back and say, we did it, boys. You know, it's over. It's fine. You know, roll on the 8th century. Things will be looking up from here. Yeah, I mean, we talk about 2020. They had a whole century. <laughs> a whole century, bless them. Wow. And w when you do get this changeover of power, do, do we see that they... They, they, do they take on the Irish? Because obviously, you know, speaking geopolitically, the Irish have then, you know, become the main uh, influencer and the and the main kind of supplier of kings to the Picts. Do the 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 men of Strathclyde do they try and and take on the the Irish in any way? Are there any battles recorded between them, or is it much more of a kind of subtle underground kind of proxy war that goes on between them? Well, um. When we talk about um, the Irish in this context, we're talking about Dalriada, so that's right. sort of the, the the Irish in Scotland, as it were. Um, so there's not really much going on with mainland Ireland, but yeah, when um, there's a bit of subterfuge um, going on in that. So um, after uh, Brithay Macbelly, there's one other ruler who gets booted off the throne, and then. The sons of De Ile come in. So two brothers, um, Brithe Mac De Ile and uh, Nathan Mac De Ile, um, or Nectang Mac, Mac De Ile, sorry. Um, and they're, what's interesting about them is normally when we give the names of kings, like for example, um, Brithe Mac Bele, we talk about them in relation to their, their fathers. So Brithe is the son of Bele. Um, when we talk about the sons of De Ile, De Ile is their mother's name. Um, and there are some other uh, records which seem to indicate that their father was called um, Doug Art, I, I'm definitely saying that wrong, um, who was a member of uh, Kennel Kovgul. So he was a Dalriadan, so they would probably have been viewed as Dalriadans. But it's at this time that you get an origin story coming out from, um, from Bede, of all places. So we think that Bede had some uh, in contacts in the Pictish court who gave him this origin story, which talks about how um, the Picts always chose their, well, whenever the succession was in doubt, they would choose their kings by the maternal line. Um, and so in scholarship, this was, for a lot of years, this was taken to, to mean that Pickland had a sort of matrilineage going on. This is not thought to be true now because um they're still choosing they're still choosing their kings and it was only when the succession was in doubt um but actually i think that this was i think scholarship is also leaning more towards the idea that this was a story kind of cultivated specifically by um i can't remember which son of Ile it was but one of the sons of Ile, probably nektan um to justify their claim to pickland um because i think their mother even though the name has the name de ile has a gaelic element it sort of seems that their claim to the pictish throne throne comes from their mother so we think that their mother was probably a pict um 
so yeah so they're kind of trying to justify their claim via that means and of course the kingdom of outclut don't seem to well i say of course this is um again the tinfoil hat theory um but the kingdom of outclut don't seem to let go easily um because you then get this um uh this conflict in um, let me just find the year no uh, problem i think it's yeah in from about 724 to 729 there's this struggle there's this four-way struggle where nekta makda ile who's um getting old by this point is booted off the throne by a guy called uh drust um and then there's a four-way power struggle involving um drust and alpin who seem to be two um two blokes working together and then on the other side, uh, Nekatan Makda Ile and Onuist, son of Ergoist, who, spoiler alert, wins and becomes this really um, famous Pictish king. But what's, what yeah, I find in... even I've heard of him. Yeah, uh, he has a lot of, <laughs> <laughs> lot of fun times with Northumbria, so... Uh, he does. I thought you might have. <laughs> um, but what's interesting is the names Drust and Alpin. The name Drust is a Britonic name, and the name Alpin is, it's, even though Alpin um, is a Gaelic form of, it's a Gaelic form of a Britonic name, if that makes sense. So it's ah. like a Britonic name said in a Gaelic accent. Said um, in a Gaelic way. Yeah. Um, and that might be political, right? Because I think it's his, it's his son. And is it Ga Gavin, Gabran, MacAlpin? Uh, that's the first, quote unquote, first king of of Alapa. maybe that that's why it's been gaelicized for political reasons at all wait sorry who is it am i right in thinking that this is the same uh alpin whose son it's i think it's is it Ga gavin mcalpin oh oh kinaid not gavin where have i got <laughs> gavin from this is how much i know about scottish history oh man okay let's try again kinaid mcalpin am i right in thinking that that's from that lineage or is that completely wrong i think that's separate i think that's much um later is that a hundred years later actually because that's mid ninth century isn't it yeah um okay we're, never we're mind, never mind. <laughs> okay no problem i'm gonna co let you continue with your thought while i you know read yeah. up on my scottish history yeah so well so again um there's no real way of knowing if um drust and alpin were connected to um the kingdom of outclut um, all we've got is that their names are Britonic, but I kind of, I, I do wonder if this is Britain's kind of uh, trying to take back um, control of the um, the Pictish royal dynasty and failing. That would be really interesting if it, it if it's their kind of last ditch attempt to take over. So sort of to to kind of wrap things up in a way what does end up happening to the kingdom of strathclyde because as we said it, it it survives the tumultuous seventh century and then continues on and sort of it, it, it shifts further south as well when you've got the vikings sacking dumbarton in 870 but what what eventually happens to it because of course today it's not recognized as kind of a, a separate point within the united kingdom like wales or scotland or even to a lesser extent cornwall how that's kind of seen as yeah it's in england but it's got this kind of celtic past what what does happen with Strathclyde in the end? Yeah, bless them. They kind of get um, quashed from both sides. So um, particularly with their interactions with the Kingdom of Alba by this point. So Dalriada and Pickland have kind of mushed um, into Alba, um, the precursor to Scotland. Uh, mentions of Kings of Strathclyde or Kings of the Cumbrians does start to peter out. Um, and you where you do see them you see them kind of in a lot of times in relation to the kings of alba um so for example in um 937 there's the Brattle, battle of uh, Brenamba, um which uh yeah again coming back to northumbria um it's uh, hey. yeah uh it's yeah it's a battle between athelstan um and uh, a sort of northern alliance between, um, yeah, so the northern alliance is kind of made up of uh, Hiberno Norse leader, 
um, and also Constantine the Second of Alba and King Owain of Strathclyde. So you've kind of got the King of Strathclyde working with the King of Alba. Unfortunately, well, or fortunately, if you're Northumbrian, um, the uh, they lost. So Athelstan beat them, um, and I think they had a pr- bit of a brutal time of it after that. Um, got a nice poem out of it you know yeah. <laughs> silver lining you win some you lose some um yeah and so then you get another mention of them with king edgar there's a king of the cumbrians is mentioned among the kings who supposedly um rode edgar along the river d um mm. and, and edgar's the the let me think 960s 970s that kind of vague yeah period uh, yeah exact nine, i think he's nine five nine to nine seven nine but don't quote me on that one i think that's roughly when we're talking nine something um oh um 973 i found it ah so is that the start of his reign or the uh his um is it's his coronation at chester right that's when he gets rolled yeah. up the d yeah um and yeah one of the kings there is called um malcolm king of the cumbrians so you know, they're still existing, if only in kind of side mentions. Um, okay. Again, by um, in 1018, there's another battle where, um, uh, again, a king of, um, yeah, a king of the Strathclyde Britons is sort of working with um, a king of the Scots. Um, and... Uh, yeah, so, but this kind of maybe, not quite sure whether the King of the Scots had control over them by that point, if this is them working as kind of a sub king. Um, but then, in the 1050s, when all hope looks lost, they have another stroke of luck um, where Edward the Confessor um, decides he wants to depose the Scottish king, who happens to be Macbeth. Um, and- oh, wow. <laughs> And, that was an unexpected turn. Yeah, so um, Edward the Confessor sends up um, Earl Seward of Northumbria. Again, pronunciation, yay. Uh, Perfect, don't worry, completely fine. And so Earl Seward marches up, deposes, um, yeah, deposes Macbeth, and then he... Plays... With his army of trees. Yeah. Yes, absolutely, 100% historical. Um, and then places somebody called Mael Kaluim, um on the throne. So Malcolm, who is, who happens to be known as the son of the King of the Cumbrians. So Ah. even if he's not King of the Cumbrians himself, a descendant of a King of the Cumbrians, um, possibly the one who fought at the Battle of Karam in 1018, um, is now on the throne. And they get, so that's the sort of last hurrah for the Kingdom of Strathclyde. And then, That's fascinating. Yeah, and then 1066, the Normans come. Um, all the yeah, the Anglo-Saxons are booted out, and Strathclyde no longer Strathclyde. has a leg to stand on. I mean, I guess you can kind of see it in the way of the. Do you, do you know the meme of the guy sort of tapping his head? That one. It's kind of like you can't get conquered by the Scottish if you become the king of the Scottish. I guess maybe that's the kind of situation that happens where it's okay to become a part of that kingdom because you've taken it over in a way. Yeah, I just I just remember being so excited when I first learned this book because it's sort of like, and then it was all over. But wait. <laughs> It's like, um, did you watch Horrible Histories? I'm, I yeah. was about to add as a child, but of course we still watch Absolutely. Horrible Histories. Like we're 2021, 20, we still watch it. But like the the weather forecast guy, Bob Hale, yes. was always like, but not for long. If, I feel like that's the, the summary of Strathclyde is just, but not for long, because then they come back with this and wow. So in a way, they never lost at all. They really kind of, they kept going, you know, they came top dog. And am I right in thinking that that Malcolm is Malcolm Canmore, the one who starts that dynasty? I actually have no clue. Uh... <laughs> okay. Unconfirmed, but it may be Malcolm Canmore who started the Canmore dynasty in Scotland, who ruled for a little while. They, I think they were fairly, uh, they, they ruled for quite a bit until I think the English get involved. But that's that's just Scottish history after that point. You know, it was all going well until the English got involved. Oh, I'll just I'll just look that up because I'm curious now. No problem. Yeah, I think it might be Malcolm Campbell, and then you get a lot of Alexanders and you get a lot of kings killing each other. But 
to the kind of murky early history of, of the Kingdom of Scotland, which was a lot bigger than it is today. It stretched right the way down to Carlisle was still Scottish. I think at one point it even came close to York, unconfirmed, but it was uh, a lot more, a lot bigger than it is now. And certainly, you know, past Berwick upon Tweed, that was certainly Scottish for a long time. Any luck on Malcolm Canmore? Louisa, I'm going to have a Google look. Wait, now. wait. Oh, it says, okay, well, according to Wikipedia, that 100% accurate historical source, um, the uh, Melchluim, son of the King of the Cumbrians, is traditionally identified with the later Malcolm III. So maybe ah. not, but... Okay. It's it's a fun idea that they might be connected. Because I've got here that Malcolm III was King of Scotland from 1058 to 1093. So that's the roughly the same date line, right? The son of King Duncan. So sorry, what date? The first. 1058 to 1093. Yeah, well, it's in uh, it's in 1054. Okay. So, I don't know how that squares. But I've got... Maybe. So. Unconfirmed, but if there are any, you know, good historians and people interested watching who knows more than we do, please let us know in the comments below if you want to join us in wearing our, our Strathclyde stamp tinfoil hats in saying that the Strathclyde kings became the kings of Scotland and they founded the Camel dynasty. I am actually not sure, but I think that would be really cool if that was the case. I would love um, I, I mean, I think that would be a really cool... Yeah, so an English invasion in 1054 with Seward. Also, any Frisians watching, Seward is the old uh, English version of the name Stuart in modern Frisian. Fun fact. Um, but anyway, so Seward, Earl of Northumbrian Command, had its goal the installation of Mail Column, son of the kings of the Cumbrians. So I think that may... Uh, yeah, and he's been traditionally identified with the later Malcolm III. But yeah, he killed Macbeth and potentially became Malcolm... Oh, it's com it's complicated. The death of Macbeth at Malcolm's hands. Macbeth was succeeded by Lulach, who was crowned at Scone after this. Malcolm became king, perhaps being inaugurated. So I think the I think they think it is him, because I think they have this struggle against Macbeth and then his son, and then in 1058 he becomes crowned king. So I think that means that this is the the male column the son of the King of the Cumbrians. Yeah, okay. According wow. to Wikipedia, it says Malcolm III, later nicknamed Canmore. So oh, this is, perfect. This is entirely based on Wikipedia searches, but I would be so up for that. Oh, hot take. Wait, Scotland look, is Strathclyde. The, Scotland is Strathclyde. It just is. Oh, man. It's like, because that's the, it's always the big debate in Scottish history of whether was it Pickland that swallowed Dalriada or Dalriada that swallowed Pickland? Now nah, you're both wrong. It was Strathclyde. <laughs> All along, it was Strathclyde. Wow. I think that's the conspiracy theory that we should end this on. I think we need a hashtag. Like, hashtag make Scotland Strathclyde again. Is that too long of a hashtag? I think it's quite catchy. I love it. I think that'll work. Yeah, perfect. But anyway, Sarah, thank you so much. This has actually been so fascinating because, as I said many times, as an excuse for my ignorance during this podcast, I'm not too clued up on the, the more Celtic side of things and the Brythonic Celt in Northern England and Scotland. But this has been an amazing insight. And thank you so much for, for your time and for explaining so much about this. One more thing before um, I head off. Where can people find out more about the Kingdom of Strathclyde? Because obviously you've done your dissertation on it. Um, and as we've said, Wikipedia isn't always the most reliable source if people want to find out more. But are there any books you would recommend, any documentaries or, or uh, historians that people can maybe get in touch with or, or look up if they want to find out more? Well, the series that I looked up most for my dissertation would be um, James, uh, James Fraser's um, From Caledonia to Pickland. Um, and that's part of a series um, of books that sort of look at Scottish history um, in its mm. entirety. Um, it focuses much more on the Picts, but that's kind of the problem of studying the North Britons and that everybody wants to talk about the Picts. Um, and then after that book, you've got another in the series by Alex Wolfe called um, From Pickland to Alba. So I think... I've got that one. Yeah, it's a good one. Yeah, that, that, that's a good series to, to go with. 
Okay, so that's that's a good introductory piece of material. Um, I'll see what else I can find, and if you think of anything else, uh, Sarah, I'll I'll put it in the description below, so that people, if you're interested, just head on down into the description, um, and and you can find it there. Sarah, would you be happy for people to to read your dissertation? Is that even allowed with the rules? I actually have no clue. Uh, okay. <laughs> may, maybe no promises. Uh... No problem. I mean, you can always get back to me, and if it's all fine, then I'll stick it in the description. But if it's not there, then for for legal reasons, unfortunately, you'll just have to wait until Sarah publishes her first book on the subject, which I'm sure is forthcoming. Now that she has all of this amazing knowledge that she wants to share with the world. I am. But anyway, yeah. Oh, I'm just, I'm so chuffed. I didn't expect to come out with a new conspiracy theory about Strathclyde. Well, I, I'm very happy that we came up with it. Honestly, hashtag make Scotland Strathclyde again. It's, you know, it's the truth. It needs to out. I think it needs to out. But Sarah, thank you so much once again for, for coming on and for sharing your knowledge with us. I really appreciate you taking the time to do it. And thank you all for listening in and tuning into this episode of the History with Hilbert podcast, which hopefully will be uploaded more frequently on a Wednesday. So uh, stop by, share it with your friends, enjoy it. And until next time, on chain.